its body other than the face itself. There are in fact four different types of, uh, you know, what we think of as Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Very wide, pronounced nose. There was also a very ominous uh, odor. Phase one is to identify opportunities. I walked into a small clearing uh, and less than 10, 15 feet away from uh, this enormous creature and uh, it scared the living hell out of me. Phase two is conducting investigations both of witnesses and locations. Size of the thing, it was, you know, four or five feet across the shoulders. Phase three is profiling research areas, what's there, how they move, feeding, things like that. About eight feet tall, I guessed around 800 pounds, it was massive. I had no idea that anything like that existed. Phase four is create an intercept plan. I decided to shoot in the air to see if maybe it would scare it off. Phase five is the intercept and resolve the issue phase. It didn't do anything, didn't react. And then I heard a noise from my right rear and from out behind some brush come another one and walked over by the first one. That's when I decided to do what the dog did. I took off running. Welcome to Witness of the Unknown. Hello everyone. I'm speaking to a longtime contact from the Pacific Northwest. Lee, how are you this morning? Well, I'm awake. Yeah, I know that Awful feeling. <laughs> so how's everything how in the been, Northwest man? these days? I, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, well, uh, it's kind of amusing is probably the best word you know it's uh things have changed so much over the last eight or ten years that it's hard to uh even recognize when you go out into the woods how so well there are so many shows tv shows podcasts things of that nature um when you go out now it's it's almost hard to do what you want to do in the forest, and because there's so many knuckleheads that have been watching the TV shows and listening to podcasts and think that they know what they're doing, that it it makes it really hard to go out. And well, you know, up in the Pacific Northwest, there are literally people every weekend from Friday through Sunday out in the woods thinking that, you know, they watched a few TV shows, they've listened to podcasts, that they're now experts. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it, it just, I ran into people that had absolutely no clue of uh, what they were actually doing in the forest. And it's really hard because you, you want to give them some advice, right, to be safe and, you know, and not only with the subject at hand, there's bears, mountain lions. There's a whole bunch of other critters out there that can make your life hard. And these people aren't prepared for it. And I've spent more time the last three years up here trying to stay away from where these people go and finding new places to, you know, go do my research. Yeah, I think it's difficult. A lot of people go out... <clears throat> And you're right, they don't have any uh, concept of, and there's a lot of problems these days not with bears, increasing problems with bears and cougars, um, let alone a Sasquatch. And there's, you know, they wonder why they go out and they, they don't find anything is because it's like a circus. Well, let me give you an example. This happened about, oh, maybe a year, year and two months ago, just before fall. No, actually, about this time of year, last year, um, I went with a friend of mine who owns some property 
uh, that borders up against the National Forest in Oregon. And um, he has, well, you could call it a hunting cabin. That's what they call it. Mm-hmm. On several hundred acres, it's waterproof, has a few windows, and that's about it, right? So before hunting season every year, we go up and we make sure that it's watertight. And, you know, sometimes you have to, it's an old log cabin is what it is. You have to fill in all the chinks in the logs and, you know, make sure that it, if it starts raining or snowing, if you get stuck up there during fall, because it is at a high altitude, you don't end up being in the shower for two days while you're inside the building, inside this cabin. So we went up there and uh, we stopped. It was about four in the afternoon. This is fall and it was just before hunting season just before deer season. I think bow season was open, um, but it's private property, so we didn't have to worry about that. And we saw a group of people about 50 yards off the road in this little meadow and a bunch of vehicles. So we stopped and we started watching them. And as it started to get darker, they started pulling out headlamps. And, you know, they had a, they were cooking some food and it was a group of people. Well, these were people that were out there to be, what's the word, squatching. Oh, I was, thinking, I was, I was thinking bait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, that was probably a better term. But we started, we just backed the truck in on, uh, in between some trees on a uh, turnaround area. And we started watching them. And the funny thing about it, as it started getting dark, You could see all their headlamps, right? And, you know, they had a fire going, and and they were, like I said, they were cooking food, and a couple of guys had sticks out, and, you know, about two hours into it, we're sitting there laughing. We're watching this whole thing, right? And they were making so much commotion that it was, I I thought, how are they ever going to see a single animal? Right. It did the noise that they were talking and yelling and making quote calls, calling them in, banging on trees. We had the windows down in his truck and I told him, let's get out of here. This is, this is asinine. He goes, no, no. He goes, let's watch this a little bit. So I said, okay. We sat there. Well, about at 40 minutes after they got started into their serious work, we started hearing other knocks coming from the direction that we were heading. And I thought, what the hell? Finally, I'm hearing tree knocks, right? Mm-hmm. And because I had only heard maybe one or two in my entire life. And I think there was them throwing something at me, not them knocking on trees. And so we got up and we started to leave. You know, we put our stuff back in the back of the truck because we were eating and stuff while we were sitting there. And we put our stuff in the back of the truck and we started heading on down the road and lo and behold, a mile down the road on the other side of the river and another wide area pull out was another group doing the same thing, (laughs) literally doing the same thing. And these guys were answering each other's knocks and calls. And they stayed out there. I don't know how long we left. We were laughing so hard. By the time we left, I told him, I didn't know if he was going to be able to drive. He was laughing so hard. He had tears in his eyes. He goes, these people are stupid. Um, On another occasion, I went out, was going out to use his property for just this specific purpose. He wasn't going to go out hunting. It was in the fall. So I was going to go out and use his cabin and just sit out there all night. I took food and everything I needed. And uh, I stopped at a store at a campground to pick up some extra bottled water. And when I was coming out of the store, um, I ran into a young couple, young. Uh, I mean, we're a couple of older gentlemen, maybe a stretch, but we're a couple of older guys 
and I'm looking at this young couple and they're talking about where they're going to go back into the woods. And I'm, this is now late fall. And anyone that's ever been into the Cascade Range in late fall, you need to be prepared for anything. Because it can start raining, it can start snowing. Um, you can't just go in with a little day pack and whatever clothes you have on your body. You've got to be ready for anything. It's about 10, 30, 11 in the morning. So I started asking them when they were going. I knew exactly where it is. I knew where the trailhead was. And I told them, did you fill out a so the Forest Service would know where you were going. They said, no, there was only going to be a day hike. And I'm looking at them, I said, do you guys have jackets? Well, our fleece one's here. And it was maybe 55 degrees at 10, 30, or 11 in the morning. It wasn't going to be much warmer than that. I said, you know that it may rain. I said, do you have any extra food? And I said, do you have a compass? I said, because if you get up there and it starts raining, you're going to have to find your way out, and a compass would be nice to have. The young man's response was, sir, I have my cell phone, and Google Map will help me find my way out. <laughs> Good luck getting reception. I said, <laughs> well, I told him, I said, uh, you're not going to have cell service up there. And he's like, well, yeah, I have Verizon. I have cell service everywhere. <clears throat> I'm like, okay. Well, they came out a few hours later, and they were sopping wet. I stopped at the store again. Uh, the next morning, I went back and got picked up some stuff that I needed. And they said that couple came back at 2.30 in the afternoon. They'd only been out a few hours. They, the lady at the store said they looked like two sopping wet puppies and they were freezing and had no clothes to change into and asked the store owner for towels. And they're going out to do this in the woods. That's what they were going, because they had heard uh, uh, a podcast or something of how easy it is to go out and do this I, I in can, the forest. I can relate two quick things that are exactly along those lines. The first one is my buddies and I, when I was still in Washington, we would go camping up by Mount Rainier up near the uh, Nisqually entrance fairly close and you would think there'd be cell reception up there uh each one of us had different carriers i had verizon my phone would work as long as we got to the campground beyond that there was absolutely no cell reception and as far as going out uh a good friend of mine from seattle came down uh, one time when i lived in vancouver we decided to walk a trail we crossed a small stream that was maybe maybe a foot deep to an area where i had found tracks we started hiking up the slope. The rain hit. When we came back, uh, the little foot-deep stream was now five feet deep, and it was almost impossible to cross. So that can that kind of stuff can happen in minutes. Yeah, that's you know it. When when these people listen to these shows, there are so many shows. I don't. I stopped listening to shows years ago, and um, because most of it, yeah, there's a lot of great storytelling and we'll get to that later but <clears throat> when people think because they're going out there with good intent that they're going to be safe and not prepare for i mean i was taught is at eight years old to have changes of clothes to have a jacket to have all of these things when you went out yeah you got to lug a lot of extra stuff but you never, I carry four emergency space blankets. They call them space blankets. Mm -hmm. And I don't need four, but they take up the size of a large wooden matchbox, right? So I can stuff those in one of the cubbies. I have a, oh, I think it's an East German, an old East German uh, day pack. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the military ones, the kind of teardrop shaped. And, <clears throat> you know, I pack enough stuff for two days, even though I'm only going out for six or eight hours, Right. sometimes nine. I've got enough stuff in there for two days. And then I have Mr. Emergency, which is my flare gun. 
that if I get myself in this deep doo-doo, which I have, I've never had to use the flare gun, but I carry one anyway. And, you know, people, that they just don't understand. And I, we had, we were at one time, we were up over 8,000 feet. And we were at, it was a high mountain canyon. This is in the Central Cascades in Oregon. And it dropped into a couple of different ravines that each had a year-round streams that weren't very big. Uh, maybe like, you, you know, six, eight feet across foot or two deep in areas mm -hmm. and these ravines came down towards the eastern side of the slope and went down into a big valley both ravines emptied in each side of the valley and it was a great place to get right in the middle and catch these things coming out of the mountains at night because they were always up above well our starting point for when we went out was at 5,000 feet. So everything that we did from there up, well, you know, all went up in elevation and drastically. Right. I mean, you go in a mile, mile and a half, you're up eight, nine, 10,000 feet. And we wouldn't go up that high. We would only go up high enough that we could, you know, maybe you should tell these people how I do my research. Well, <laughs> I'll leave that to you because you're you're better at telling it. Uh, okay. Well, I am. I, I do stealth. I hide. I conceal myself. And there's only a couple of people that know you know the method mm -hmm. that I use. Right. And I do that because a lot of the times I'm by myself or I'm with another person. Now, I always tell people not to go by themselves, but you can't go into a situation like this with someone that you can't trust because as one of, one of the uh, drill instructors said a long, long, long time ago, the first one to run is the first one that dies. He used to tell us that all the time. And so I conceal myself. now. For a lot of people out there, they're going to say, oh, that's stupid and this, that, and the other. But I go about it, I'm pretty painstaking about it. I don't just I, go into a tree stand and think that's going to cut it because it won't. Um, I do it much different method, and I'm not going to tell people how I do it because it works for me. It doesn't mean it's going to work for you. But you know exactly how I do it. And not well, everybody should be doing it. No. Um, and, and that's it actually, if you don't know what you're doing, you shouldn't do it at all. It is the probably I've gotten myself into some very, very bad situations doing this. And I don't know, maybe you want me to tell the one? Yeah. Well, go, yeah. Go right ahead. I think people should know so, these things. Um, just a couple of years ago, um, I got a phone call of some activity around some remote homes in Oregon. And some of the people were very concerned. They, they kind of knew what was happening, but they weren't a hundred percent sure. And I, it, the name was passed around through several people and found its way to me. And so I gave the family a call. I told them I'd come out and take a look. Well, I went out there. I wasn't expecting, to be perfectly honest, well, you know this, Will. I wasn't expecting to find anything. I figured they had raccoons or a mountain lion in the area because they had heard screams and things like that. I was not expecting to find a single thing because when I looked out on the map, well, the map was very misleading. Even with Google Maps, with the way the forest is, it was very misleading. So Was that the people I was I in touch with, there. too? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. So Will actually knows all of this, what happened behind the scenes. So I go up there and I got up, I got over there. It was, I don't know, late in the afternoon. So I went and had a good dinner, took a nap in my truck, got some food, got some of my snacks together. And I was fairly heavily armed. I didn't, I never, and that's one of my basic rules. 
I never go into the woods without at least two weapons, ever, ever, ever. And um, so I had the weapons. Actually, I was in my truck. I didn't think I had to worry about it. And I drove around to where they were hearing this. And once I drove actually up into the area, because Google Earth, like I said, it was very misleading. Once I got there and I realized, ooh, this isn't good. I sat there from my truck or in my truck for, I don't know, what seemed like several hours. And um, I was listening to some talk radio and stuff, and I was at the top of a hill. The hill was probably, I don't know, 2,000 feet high. Uh, It was over towards the coast. And I'm sitting there, and I thought, well, I kind of got bored and was going to read a book. And I shut the radio off, so I shut the ignition off on my truck. And it wasn't within, it must have been about 9.30 at night. Um, I started hearing a ruckus. And I had had enough experience. I knew exactly what that sound was. And the thing that alarmed me is these individuals didn't care they were making so much noise. And I remember thinking, wait a minute, what's going on here? I mean, they were crashing through the forest like they didn't give a damn who heard them. I heard them from a long ways off. And I remember thinking, what, you know, because all of my other encounters, they're pretty good about being stealthy, right? Right. So they kept getting closer and closer and closer. And then finally, I got to the point where I knew they were within, and there was more than one. Um, I ultimately found out there were three of them. And they were moving through a section of forest where I had seen it in the daytime. It looked like a path underneath these trees, but the path was eight feet tall, Mm -hmm. roughly, and about 10 feet wide. Sasquatch tree. And I mean, the brush was mowed down, or Mm -hmm. not mowed down like with a mower, but it was tromped down, and it was like their own personal highway. And I was parked at the end of it, and I sat there for, till I I figured they were close enough. And by this point, I had all kinds of alarm bells going off. And I was wanting to test a theory, you know, the theory that we talked about. Mm -hmm. I had been wanting to test a theory, and... As they got, I I figure, I don't know for sure, I just started to see the outline of one, and so 20 yards. Now, the area that I was parked in was open. It was cleared. There were no trees. But I had my headlights in my truck pointed directly at this opening. And as soon as I figured they got close enough, I started my truck, turned on the headlights, turned on my high beams, and hit the horn. And these things did an about face and took off running. And I mean, the crashing was bad enough coming in. It was much louder going out, and they were moving very fast. So I got, I started my truck while it was running. I backed it up, got down to the road, and the road system there is kind of messed up. You have to, there's no direct route to get into and out of the area. You have to kind of make a right and a left and a right and a left. By the time I got back down to the main road, they had already crossed it. And it was a couple of miles away. And it didn't take me long. I'm driving 35, 40, 40, 45 miles an hour down this road. They had already crossed it. And they went into a swampy area. And I could still hear them. I couldn't see them, but I could hear them. And... I thought, well, where are they going? And so I started kind of paralleling them. I'd pull up, stop, turn off my truck. I could hear them crashing through the woods. They were always ahead of me at this point, Um, several hundred yards, but you could still hear them because it was stone quiet. There was no traffic. There were no cars. I only saw a few homes. They were far, I mean, like hundreds of yards apart. And then I found a turnoff, a dirt road, which I ultimately found out was an access road 
for the power company, for the big, the really big overhead lines, like that go across the state type. Mm-hmm. And so I followed that in and parked, and I had heard them. They were still 200 yards in front of me, moving very quickly. And I got out of my truck, grabbed my stuff, and you got, <laughs> you always laugh when I, I put my little trail markers out, but I won't tell anyone what it is, but it works for me. I grabbed my little trail marker, and I headed out, and within about 60 or 80 yards from my truck was a great big wide opening for these huge overhead power lines. I mean the big ones, you know, where they have two sets of, you know, the the super tall ones that have four or six lines on each one right. that go for miles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was like that, and there was this big wide opening on either side of it with a creek in the middle of it. So I go out there, don't see anything, don't hear him anymore. So I thought, I'm just going to walk to the other side. And I had to walk up a little ways to find a, somebody had made a little bridge out of pallets and on an old wood to ride their mountain bikes across this creek. And I crossed it over and I went over to the edge of the woods on the other side and I could hear him. So I got the bright idea that I was going to go see if they were still moving away. So I ventured into the woods, not very far, but I ventured into the woods anyway. And I got about, I don't actually know how many, because I walked for a few minutes very quietly, you know, walking this way and that. And then I realized that they, they were... They were right there, weren't in they? A sem- Yes, they were in a semicircle around me. I had one to the north, one to the east, and one to the west. And so I hunkered down in a tree. Now, I'm pretty well camoed up. I didn't have a light on. There was patchy clouds, um, enough of a moon that you could see the slivers of light between the trees. And I just hunkered down for a few minutes and thought, "Uh uh-oh. What do I do now? And I I, uh, sat there, and I started hearing this clicking sound. And the clicking sound, hold on here. The clicking sound was coming from the one in the north. And every time he would click, and it wasn't a set amount every time, he'd click a couple of times, three or four times, he would do this click. I would hear one of the other ones moving. And then a few minutes later, that one that was moving would start clicking. And then I would hear one of the others moving. And I got up and moved very quickly to the south. And what I, what I was trying to do now is I needed to get the one that was to the west, north of me, so I could get out to the opening. Yeah, they were repositioning time, themselves around you. Yeah, and, and I was trying to reposition against them. And <clears throat> this went on for a long time, this moving and clicking and moving and clicking, and it came time for me to test my theory. Um, part of it was with the truck and the lights, and that worked. The second part was, okay, what do I do once I'm in this much trouble? And after I don't know how long, it was, it was, it was a while, because I had moved four or five times, and I was moving about every 15 or 20 minutes. And I decided I'd had enough. And so... I started acting like I was talking to someone, very loud. I mean, boisterous. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, did you hear that? Hey, did you see that? And then I would answer back in another voice. And I did this for a while, and the clicking stopped completely. The movement stopped. I'd go quiet, and I did this, and I started kind of ramping it up, started, you know, digging around in my bag and 
you know, make a noise. And the one to the west, which was my biggest concern, was the one that I think, I don't know for sure, but it sounded like he was moving towards you. And once he got to that point, I just cooked the safety off my rifle, and I had uh, three 30-round thermal mags in it, and I started ripping off rounds and yelling and turning on my light. And, I mean, I was screaming, here they come, and, you know, fire off rounds. And all of a sudden, they started crashing off again and started heading to the east or east, northeast. And once I knew that all three of them were moving away from me to what I felt was a safe distance, I got up and ran my ass back out to that opening, got back to my truck, and literally it scared the death out of me. And I went back and I actually, (laughs) I couldn't drive, I was so shaken up. I I made it back to town, to the town, and there was a Fred Myers there and I slept in the parking lot uh, for a few hours and then headed back to the house. contacted the family the next day well i contacted you i think you first Mm -hmm. letting you know what i had done and after you were done chewing my ass out (laughs) for going out by yourself (laughs) yes uh i contacted the family and the behavior stopped stopped at their house for a long long time and just to show you how foolish people can be I went back a year after that and stopped and talked to the wife and, you know, told her who I was and stuff like that. And and she said that they had activity again, but they were storing the garbage around their house. And so, no, what is that old saying? People get tired of doing the impossible for the ungrateful. Yeah. Right. So I I told her, I said, you know, I'm not coming back here. I'm not going to help you again. Oh, they had many bags of trash around their house. So it was a situation. I don't know if they were trying to recreate it because they missed them. I don't know. Some people like the... I don't know. Guess being scared out of their wits. You know, I but, I remember that situation very well because they were desperate when they contacted me to have these creatures go away. They had little kids. They were coming up to the windows, looking at the little kids' tracks right in yeah. the yard. I mean, it was it was a bad situation. Yep. And it worked. It kept them away. It did. And and until the bad habits came back. And, and, and that's what I mean. What, what do you do? You know, because you know what we told the guy, Mm -hmm. what to do around his home. And it, it, I've heard this so many times now over the years, uh, one lady with a grain for her animals, you know, she would keep in a, one of those cheap plastic sheds that you would get like at home Depot to put your lawnmower in. Mm -hmm. She, she had bags and bags of feed for various animals in there. And she couldn't figure out where the bags of corn were going. And it, it, it's like, is it locked? Well, no. Um, do you have any other kind of animals coming around? You know, deer? She goes, no, no, no. You misunderstand me. The bags are gone. Carried away. 50 pound bags. That's what she told me. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, put them inside the barn and lock the barn. What's too far away? Okay. Have a nice day. You know, and leave it at that. That's about all you can do because if you can't get people, it's, I don't know. I've ran into that now. Well, multiple times. And the people that do the things that we ask, have you ever heard back from that guy in the Midwest? I have not, no. I, and there's, you're right. I've heard, I get periodic emails from people, you know, seeking advice to get rid of these things. I tell them the same thing every time. Some follow it, always with success. 
others don't follow it and have continued problems. Actually, the problems are ramping up. Yeah. That, well, they're coming back looking for their meal ticket. Um, and it doesn't matter. You can have fruit trees. I don't know what it is about the Russian olives that these things like. I don't find them. Uh, I don't even think they're edible. But they come back to those. Well, look at the story that we talked about a while back in Washington with the apple trees. Right. You know, it's it. it they will find a food source. And this is one of the funny things that I find out about all of the experts. Um, I have contacts of my own. In fact, you and I have contacts in the same places with different people. Right. And I don't want I don't want any everyone listening here to think Will and I agree on everything. We don't. In fact, we argue <laughs> a lot of times over what we think is going on because a lot of times the people won't tell us all the information they'll tell us bits and pieces and you have to try to fill the gaps they've done something foolish they don't want to look foolish and so what happens is is you think well i'm leaning this way no i'm leaning this way but that's how you keep everything honest and up front because if everybody agreed on everything then there's you know it's not right because nobody has the right answer when it comes to this. There's only those things that you can do to help yourself in a situation. And if you follow those things, they tend to work. And uh, I get people sending me recordings all the time. Hey, did you hear this? What do you think about this? And I'll ask. You know, how long did we fight against the digital camera thing and orbs. Oh, geez. <clears throat> and that's and that's simply an artifact of the camera. Yes. And if you read the booklet that comes with your camera, it states that when the autofocus and the light sensing for the flash will pick up minute, tiny pieces of moisture or dust and will show up as an artifact in the picture and what does it show up as an orb Mm -hmm. i don't know how many times both you and i contacted people telling them read the book i called nikon about my camera once and the the nikon usa (laughs) the guy that answered the phone started laughing so hard his headset came off (laughs) he he had a headset. I had to wait almost two minutes for this guy to stop laughing and get his headset on. He goes, we get these calls all the time. People think they're UFOs or people think it's, uh, you know, a leprechaun or people think it's this or people think it's that. He goes, and it's in the manual. He goes, they just will refuse to believe it. Right. <clears throat> and that's... <clears throat> Uh, well, I told you, a buddy of mine contacted me about some of my other uh, times that I've gone out here recently, and I didn't go out a lot at all this summer. I, I needed a break from it because it can overwhelm you at times if you stay out there and doing this an awful lot. And I told him about six different, and in fact, we were talking about this the other day, six different things that were almost identical as far as interaction with three different outcomes, two of them were very good. See, when you hide or when you apply stealth, a lot of times they will know you're there. Mm -hmm. And I I know it sounds funny, but I think a lot of times they would spot my truck and know I was in the area, whether if it was parked or if I was driving out there late in the day. Um, but when I hide, as I call it, when I hide and I conceal myself, they tend to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. But the outcome at the end of the evening can be very different. Well, in these six that I was... It puts them off. I mean, they, they don't quite know how to react to that. It, they don't like it at all because 
they know you're there. And some of them, it becomes a curiosity thing where you can hear them moving around you. Right. Some, sometimes one, sometimes a couple. They're always a ways away. They never, I'm not talking they're moving 15 feet from me. I'm talking they're moving around me 30, 40 yards, 50, 60 yards. You can hear them. And they make it known that they know you're there, but they don't know where. And you'll hear them moving back and forth. And when people say that, well, I've seen this and, you know, this thing just took this straight line through the woods for miles, that's horse pucky. I've never seen one of these things unless they're absolutely angry walk in a straight line. It's unusual. Even even the old stories, <clears throat> you know, they were in John Green's books. They always talk about them moving in these erratic patterns, never a straight line. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if they're moving in a straight line, you best look for an exit. Because there's a reason why they call it a beeline. Because if they're going from point A to point B, and that's you, they're not happy. And most of the rest of the time, you can hear them. They'll walk, they'll be 20, 30 yards away, and then they'll be 40, 50 yards away. Yeah. And it's so funny because it's like they're like a snake. A great big, they just back and forth mm -hmm. and meander around. That's, so the, the, that's the most can, common one. I'll, that's the most common yeah. type of movement they do. And, and when you follow their prints, it'll be like that. Exactly. And <clears throat> so the first two were very much the same. Curiosity, moving around, not really pushing the issue. Two others were pretty much the same thing. They were a little agitated, um, log throwing, big rocks, never towards me or in anywhere close to where I was concealed. But you'd hear them throwing things. And then the last two, which were downright, they were pissed. And one that I became familiar with, I don't ever actually think I ever saw him. I mean, I, he might have been one that I had seen on another occasion, didn't know it. But he would do this short, wheezy, it wasn't a grunt, and it wasn't a scream. It was like both, from the lungs, but it was short, mm -hmm. almost like a bark. Kind of like I, a bark. I don't know. I can't ex Yeah. But it was real raspy and real sharp sounding. And... <clears throat> He did that, well, I started, you know, it was another one of those times where I started getting very worried. And um, he did that for a long time. And then they finally got pissed off and left, and the, the other occasion was very similar. Throwing big logs, big logs. You know, it sounded like uh, I, I someone ran into a tree with a quad. I, I got to tell you something. <laughs> it made me think of back when I was in the Army. I was, uh, my first couple of years, I was with an armored cavalry unit in Europe. And uh, as a reconnaissance specialist, and that's one of the forms of reconnaissance is reconnaissance by fire. In other words, you take a pot shot in the direction you think something's in, and if it shoots back, you found him. <laughs> yep, yep, and, and they still use that today. And I'll tell you about that bark. That made me, Every time I hear things, it always reminds me of something I've read or heard before. Um, there was an old story. And, and I think it was one in one of John Green's books, many years ago I read it, where a witness, and I can't remember if he was a hunter or what he was, actually saw one of these things, and I think the creature didn't know he was there, but he saw it lift its head and make this short, uh, exactly what you described, and he described it in the same words, as a, as a bark, uh, and then got a response a short time later, but uh, it would do that a few times in a row, and then... Um, I apparently detected him and left, but it's very interesting when I hear these things that repeat. Yeah, and and I, you know, like some of these wild calls that people claim, I typically I hear the same four or five things, and you know, very early in the evening when they come out of the high country. Um, I don't know if it's announcing their presence or what, but the one one of the main areas I did a couple of years ago um, that uh, I couldn't go back there because they they ended up cabling off the the road, the mm -hmm. Forest Service access road to it, and I wasn't going to go that far on foot back in there. But um, 
about 15 miles apart, I would guesstimate. I did it on Google Earth. I did you know point to point measuring air miles, straight line. Mm-hmm. It's about 15 miles, but to drive it, it's about 35 or 40. And there were two. What well, the only thing that I could imagine is it was two competing groups because the ones that would come out of the mountain from the south and then there were other ones that were 15 or 20 air miles that would come out from the north and they would scream and you'd hear these screams back and forth between these groups now it wasn't all the time it was only four or five times but i took it as competing groups yeah competing but over the hunting area <clears throat> yeah you know i'm down here stay out I'm up here, stay out, mm-hmm. right? But the one to the south had a big boy. I never saw him. I only heard him. And he would come out when this screaming would start between these two groups. It would go on sometimes for 15, 20 minutes. The big one would come out of the south way up in elevation. He was at least 3,000 feet above us. He would let out a blood-curdling scream long, bellowing, blood-curdling scream, Mm -hmm. and all of them would shut up. He settled the issue. And, yep, he would come out. I heard that three times. And when he did that, that was it. There was no more squabbling, as I called it, between the groups. Now, people are going to go, they can't hear each other 15 miles away. Sure they can. Well, I tell you, (laughs) up in the mountains at night in these canyons and ravines, this stuff travels for miles. And if anybody's ever miles. really heard one of these things, and I don't mean just little whoops and, and junk like that, but these loud screams, and I've heard them, there is no doubt in your mind that sound can travel for miles. Yes. And I was miles away from them. I was actually in between them at the place where I would park. That's why I always thought it was interesting. And then once they, you know, started blocking off these different areas where you couldn't access it, they just came and cabled off the forest access roads, put locks, big yeah. half inch steel cable, no more access. And unless you were dumb enough to go up there at night on foot and well, which I was doing, I was always probably at a minimum four, three, four hundred 400 yards away from my truck. But I was never, I'm not one of those guys that goes out and hides at my truck. You know, parks at the end of the road and sits there at my truck all night. Yeah, I think um, most of the people that go out to claim they're so uh, quote-unquote experts is what they really do. <clears throat> yeah, and, I, and you know, and to be honest, there's some places you can get away with that. Oh, you yeah. know, but oh, yeah. it's, you're not, you're not going to have as much success up in high mountains doing that because the roads just don't go up there um you know you have to go the long way around the barn as they speak you know Mm -hmm. but things have gotten so interesting up there that between the the nonsense um it's you know i really don't have an issue with you know people doing this i'm not i'm not those one of those guys that goes out and you know needs to start a show and start bragging about it and doing all this stuff i do what i do because i enjoy it i want to know more and kind of the same way as you yeah and you know you don't make these grand claims of ufos and all this i remember years ago years ago you and i talking about hearing what sounds like a woman screaming Mm -hmm. and and other people, and I've only heard this twice, where it sounds like not a kid laughing, but like a teenager, you know, like a kid that's a little older, not an infant or something like that, mm-hmm. laughing. But it's always a long ways away, just at the edge of your hearing. And if you move towards it, it keeps moving away. Right. But this is where common sense comes in. If something is leading you deeper into the woods, There's a problem. are you dumb enough <laughs> to follow it? Yeah, exactly. 
And and, and I'm just hearing, you know, I had a, a guy that I know in Texas send me a link to a recording that somebody did a short podcast about kids crying or kids laughing. And we were talking about this years ago. I don't, what was the term that you came up with? Baiting. Baiting. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, if you hear this, and I've heard it, I've heard the woman screaming thing yeah. several times. I've only heard what sounds like a teenager or an older adolescent laughing um, once. But <clears throat> it's creepy because where I was at, the closest campground was about 15 miles away. Mm-hmm. There, there were no hiking trails. No. And it was 1030 at night. And the highway was seven miles away. I was on a uh, Forest Service access road. And I was about 300 or so yards from my truck at the edge of a clearing. And you hear that, and you start thinking, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where in the world is this coming from? You know, I've heard the, the stupid owl sounds that they make. Some of them are very good. Oh, yeah. But some of them, they sound like a drunken sailor uh, that just pulled into port, right? And you wonder, what in the world made that sound? And and then you realize it. And <laughs> Yeah, sometimes they're not very good me, imitations. <laughs> no, but some of them are, are creepy how good they are. Yeah. And I think that's got to be an older adult. I've never actually seen him do it, so I can't say. And I would suspect it's like people. You know, you get people with varying degrees of abilities. And and I think that's true in nature with most animals. You get different degrees of what they're capable of. You know, some are better, some aren't so bad or good. Yeah, so what do you do with it? You know, you start you start looking at this and you start... You, you have to piece it together. And I had... Uh, friend of a friend contact me and wanted me to explain this thing about coyotes. Okay. All right. And he said that he had heard where he lives, which is not really the Midwest, not, I think he lives in Arkansas where people have claimed that Sasquatch uses coyotes as dogs. And I told him, I can only tell you what I know from where I go. And they hate coyotes. Yeah. Well, they're giving away the, giving away the game to the food source. Yep. Once coyotes move into an area, and once at night when they start the yipping and the yapping, it messes up any other animal that's trying to hunt that area is now spoiled spoiled and if these things are in the area guess what just came up on the menu coyote yep they're going to be having coyote for dinner and we did find a spot where we found footprints and remains of coyotes Mm -hmm. and lo and behold and that area, and it was alongside a pretty good-sized river, um, the coyote problem stopped for about three or four months until others moved into the area. Mm-hmm. And I, I see, how do you make a leap like that, that these things are using coyotes as dogs? I, it's a silly assertion, and, I think. I mean, based well, on I, what? I had never, well, that's what I mean, I'd never heard <clears throat> it. See, and I, I don't listen to these shows. I go back to uh, the state trooper that I met in Washington back in 1975, and, and he was a big guy, you know, and uh, somebody you didn't mess around with. And he found a group of coyotes that were killed by these things. He followed the Sasquatch tracks, three sets of them. And it unnerved him so bad, he low-crawled out of the area with his thirty out 6 hoping they wouldn't detect him. Uh, and, and that's what they were doing. They were luring the coyotes in with uh, the similar screams that they would make that were coyote-like, and there were lots of recordings of them back then in that same area. And, you know, they so they knew. 
they knew exactly what these things were doing. They were drawing the coyotes in, killing them, and eating them. Yeah. So how do you make and the leap when we knew this many years ago to the to the assertion that they're using them as dogs? That's just silliness, I think. Yeah, and I, I don't I can't keep it straight anymore. Every time someone sends me a link to a recording, I almost I cringe. Now there's some good stuff. I'm not saying that there's not. And I'm not saying there's not some really believable stuff, but when you start hearing people that that go out in groups and don't want to take firearms because they don't want to accidentally harm something mm -hmm. and that, that that's a group I'd stay away from. And, you know, when you start, they don't understand. I used to have trick questions for people mm -hmm. to see if they really understood. The, how many, how many people have told you they were experts in the woods? <laughs> Lots of them. And how many actually <laughs> know what they're doing if you've ever gone out with them? Uh, I can't say any really. I mean, I've <clears throat> I've taken maps to places, and, and people say, "Oh, I they're they're not out here." I know every inch of this woods. And yep, when I said, "Okay, show me with your finger on the map where you've been," it's always on the roads. And then I yep. show them demonstrate that you really don't know this area. You know the roads. Yep. Yep. I had uh, I I've made a few mistakes in my years of doing this. And one of them that I made, um, I had been introduced, and you know what? I will go ahead and tell the name of this reservation. Okay. Because I, I've, I know you have a contact there, and I have one. Mm -hmm. I was introduced to this guy like four years ago, and it's in Warm Springs in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And you know about what happens at Warm Springs, right? Right, right. So... <clears throat> One of the things that I don't normally do is tell people who I talk to, because I made a mistake several years ago uh, talking with a friend of mine uh, about uh, a Native American contact that I have at a very specific reservation, a smaller one. Mm -hmm. And somebody had overheard me, and then the guy went and, you know, because I was telling my friend, yeah, I meet him at this place. You know, I go up there. He's generally always up there. I was just having a cordial conversation, and the kid overheard me. The kid went there, found the guy, and started demanding answers. Where do you go to find him? You know, this. so I stopped doing that. But oh, I want to get this straight. All you Native Americans out there, I'm not going to call you First Nations people because everyone that I've ever known that was a native, Native American, can't stand that term, all right? You are the only group of people in this entire country that everyone in this country owes a debt to. There's no way we can ever repay what happened to you guys. So let me tell you guys, I don't care what nation, what tribe, who you are, build your casinos and rob the white man blind. You have my absolute blessing on it. Because when I hear the stories of what happened to Native Americans all the way up to the 60s and 70s of sterilizing the women so they couldn't have kids. I, I mean, these stories are horrific. Build your casinos. Have at it. Rob them blind. I'm all for it. If that's your way of paying back the white man, go for it. I'm with you. Sorry, I had to get that out there because I hear people wanting me to say First Nations people and all that, and everyone that I've ever mentioned it to got a little pissed off over the term. So Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was talking to a guy at Warm Springs, and El, for any of you wannabe squatchers that want to go to Warm Springs and start being a know-it-all i'd say don't do it because <laughs> the folks there don't tolerate that stuff be prepared for a ambulance ride okay <laughs> be, uh, just telling you be prepared for an ambulance ride i don't even care if you stop at the gas station <laughs> be prepared for an ambulance ride so i was talking to them uh the guy that i was introduced to about because 
well, you and I years ago, I, I just didn't see where these things would be on that reservation. Oh, yeah. Until I was taken out far to the west side of the reservation. And the terrain is so unlike anywhere. I, I would think it would be probably like the Navajo Reservation down in uh, New Mexico. Um, because it's high deserty scrub pines, you head further west, there's bigger pine trees, there's big deep ravines. And I asked him, he goes, we hear him at times nightly, nightly. I said, well, do you ever let people come on and, you know, research this? He goes, we might let one or two people, but he goes, they don't want, because anytime trouble starts on the reservation, um, the local law enforcement takes care of it to a certain point. And then after that, it becomes a federal matter. So they do everything humanly possible to keep the feds off their reservation. They don't want them there. And you know what? I don't blame them. Yeah. You know, seeing the way that these different stories, I know you have a bunch of them. Um, I've got quite a few. What happens when this you know, feds get involved with anything. I'm not talking about just this topic. I'm talking about anything on the reservation. It becomes a mess. Yeah. Yeah. So he told me how they moved through the area. And I said, don't you guys get scared? He goes, we've dealt with this our entire lives. Our parents, well, our grandparents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I told him, I said, what do you think about, you know, all of these stories that are coming out from some of these different tribes or different reservations or different nations or whatever, he goes, <clears throat> none of it is flowery. He goes, they never used to have basket weaving contests. He goes, they didn't exchange gifts mm -hmm. with the locals. He goes, it was a fight over food and sometimes it was very bloody. Right. And that's what I've heard also. And I, I asked him, I said, so this thing about they take sick kids and bring them back healthy. He goes, they take sick kids and eat them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this is in, in, the one thing I love about these people is they are very direct. There's no pretty blunt. around the book. <laughs> yes. And I like that because you, there's no misinterpretation. Yeah, you know I, what I mean? I prefer that myself. And I asked him, I said, if I ever wanted to come back up here and do it, and he goes, you would have to have one or two of us with you. Mm -hmm. Or he said, you would get in trouble. And I said, hmm, I think I'll let it stand from now. I said, will you leave the invitation open if I want to come back later? And he says, oh, sure. He goes, can you shoot? I said, I can shoot. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. And, you know, and then he started working me through some of the other stuff that he had heard to, um, you know, family members, because, you know, they have family with other tribes, Toppenish, Yakima, mm -hmm. you know, because that's just up 97. And sure. um, he started, you know, relaying this thing. He goes, they're basically the same stories. And so I asked him, I said, uh, I told you I always had a few trick questions. Well, I gave you one, mm -hmm. you answered it. So I know that you had actually been in the woods, <clears throat> the forest. You knew what you were doing. Mm -hmm. So I asked him a, one of my trick questions, and I don't use this question anymore. I, I told him, in your history here in this area, had you ever had a predator bigger than these things? Now, 99% of the people out there can't answer this question. And... I already knew the answer of, to it, and um, I'm pretty sure you do. Mm -hmm. I haven't asked this question in years. He said, yeah, the grizzly bear. Mm -hmm. And I know right now all these expert squatchers or whatever you want to call them are calling BS on this. He goes, what was the biggest one that you have heard of? I said, the biggest one that I was heard, heard of was killed in California um, in the 1860s, I remember correctly, 
And it was nine feet tall and weighed over a ton. 2,000 pounds. Now, what he answered to me was, and you and I talked on this briefly a while back, can you imagine a grizzly over a ton? That's a big bear. Now, they had had many 1,800 pounds, 1,900 pounds, 2,000 pounds. And one of the things he told me, he goes, you want to know why they eradicated the grizzly? I said, I already kind of figured it out. He goes, there weren't as many of these things around back then. And he goes, one of their natural predators was the grizzly bear. He said the his family had passed on stories of the grizzlies being the most ill-tempered things in the country. And he said they were a natural predator to these. And they were have known to have fought. Mm-hmm. And there are and stories of them. Playing. I know this. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure who's going to win that fight. One's got better mobility, but those claws on a 2,000-pound grizzly bear... And of course, you've got the know. intelligence of the primate. Yes. So it's, and he said the these. So he had told me a story that was passed on to him when he his I think it was his father came to Sacramento back in the 1940s or 50s to some Native American thing that they were holding like a, a, a conference or something like that where one of the um, tribes from down here in Northern California, it wasn't a big one, mm-hmm. had told um, John C. Fremont early on during the Mexican-American War because they couldn't figure out where their livestock was going. Mm-hmm. They couldn't figure out, you know, that it may not, that it, it wasn't a grizzly bear because you would find what's left of your livestock right here. <laughs> yeah. You know, you would know where it was killed. Oh, yeah. And um, as people moved in after the gold rush in the late 1840s, early 1850s, and people started sending up ranches and things like that, the same things were continuing with livestock disappearing. So ranchers took it upon themselves that it was grizzlies doing it even though they weren't finding the carcass or anywhere where it had been killed. Mm -hmm. And so they started eradicating the grizzly. And the funny thing is, I think the last one was killed in California around the turn of that century. Um, The livestock kept coming up missing, as well as people and miners and people cutting the pristine forest out here. And... He said that it never stopped. They eradicated the grizzly, but it never stopped. And he goes, that's when these things really started taking off. Now, I don't know how much of that's true. you got to remember, most of their stuff is passed through stories. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can see a lot of facts in that. You eliminate one predator from the food chain in an area, another one's going to take over. Absolutely. And we saw that with coyotes after they wiped out the wolves. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. I always found that as being uh, a very interesting topic. And, and I, if you find a good resource, I know you've got a few. Have you heard anything from any of your Native Americans anywhere lately? Um, just what's going on on a couple of reservations. But uh, in terms of that kind of information, it's the same thing I've heard. Uh, and, and one of the persons, and I've, I've talked about this on shows before, where um, I, I was trying to uh, get permission to use some of the uh, photographs of the ceremonial masks representing, you know, the Sasquatch. Uh, for a mm-hmm. bit. And one gentleman I contacted, I, I found out afterwards, uh, you know, he gave me permission to use his artwork, but uh, he told me, he says, well, you want to be careful of what certain groups t- say because it really depends on their experience and, and so it could be tribal experience could be a group a band a family or an individual's experience that the whole group will 
sort of formulate their view about the Sasquatch on. So it may or may not be uh, a real experience, or it's been changed because it was maybe an individual or a family's experience over time. Uh, so we hear some of these stories about, you know, calling a big brother and stuff like that. And, and what we find is mostly what we hear on the West Coast, which is almost universally bad about these things, um, is more accurate. Yeah. Well, and he kind of alluded to that. And he, he what he basically told me, it's their own version of disinformation. Right. Um they they don't want white people around. They don't want them definitely on their reservations. And this topic, people get stupid when they go out looking. They go places, private property, all kinds of things that they shouldn't be doing. Without permission. And people don't care because, yeah, they, and they, they think they have a right. And they don't. And that's, the, you know, one of the reasons why my friend here in Oregon would tell me, you can use my property anytime. If you come out during hunting season, let me know to make sure I'm not there. Nobody else is on the property. Mm-hmm. And in fact, um, God, how long ago was that? About a year and a half ago. No, two years ago. Uh, we were up there, or I was up there. He had told me he had found signs of poaching because his property is literally on three sides covered with national forest and <clears throat> the other one is a, a small road that accesses the area and then outside of that there's some more national forest and privately owned land mixed he told me if i had time because he was out of state he was down in california um and <clears throat> if i could go check out his property because he said his son had heard shooting up there when his son was up there so i told him i'd go up there for a couple of days got together some food and my, you know, sleeping bag and a couple of guns. And I headed up there and I stayed for two days. I went out and started scouting around and I heard people one night. They're clever. Poachers are clever. Mm -hmm. I'll give them that. Uh, I don't have a problem with anyone killing a deer or an elk to feed their family, but use all the meat. Don't just take the back strap and leave the rest. And so this, this started about three years ago where I started doing this. I would go out into these areas. I'd find feeders in national forest or on his private property. Sometimes I would find small mineral blocks, salt licks, things like that. Not big ones. These Mm -hmm. guys weren't carrying 50 pounders in there, but small ones. Sure. So I went back to the hunting cabin on one occasion, got the 410 shotgun, came back out, loaded it with, uh, I don't know, I think it was number four buckshot, and I blasted the hell out of the deer feeder. And I scattered all the feed on the ground. Feed was gone the next morning, all of it. And I left this thing busted up, and I went and took the uh, mineral lick, and threw it in the creek and came back a while later, two weeks, three weeks. They had set it up a little further away, blasted the hell out of that one, did the same thing. And finally he had posted, I told my friend about this and he went and posted something on, he figured out where they were coming from and he posted like a little note put it inside a zip lock baggie and left it up there. Poachers. If I catch you again on my property, I'm going to kill you. That was it. Then they never came back. And you know, you find that stuff out there, but see, there's the opposite effect of that. You start putting feed out and licks. What else is it going to besides deer or elk? Well, you're going to get attract. predators. Exactly. Cause they're going to follow. And <clears throat> that and once they find a mineral lick somewhere uh they will be back looking for another one but you know that guy that we were talking about earlier in missouri right what happened to his 50 pounder when he put it out that night oh got packed off (laughs) yep gone the next morning 50 pounds carried off 
it's probably a coyote that did it, right? <laughs> I, I tell you, it, I, I don't know how people can, and, and the common sense of this stuff is what always bothers me. Uh, I'll tell you a story. I got contacted. Oh, it's been a while. I even, I think I even sent you the link. What was it? Uh, it's been months ago. Somebody had sent me a recording. You know, it, it, in, in this new contact that I have from my friend in Texas wants me to kind of allude to first timers, people that are new and to not get them caught up in the nonsense that they hear online. I want to, uh, for, and so I'm going to kind of shift this if it's all right with you. Will. Yeah, sure. To, to first timers, people that are new, don't listen or believe everything you hear online. Don't even listen to me and believe what I say. Research for yourself the area in which you want to go. Don't go traipsing off states for your first time. Find the closest area to you and do it gradually. Go armed. All right, now don't go out there acting like Rambo, right? Like you're going to blast the forest up because that's not going to get you anywhere because I'm telling you they know what a gun is, straight up. Mm -hmm. And I've had to discharge my firearm a couple of times. Well, that time when I was on the phone with you, Will, years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, they don't like quads, by the way. Just that's a hint. No, they don't, they don't. like quads. It pisses them off. <laughs> so that's what led to the discharge, but we'll leave that for another time. Um, if you want to do this and you live close to an area that's wooded, that has good water resources in game, you're pretty much good to go. But do it slow. Research your own area. Thanks, everyone, for joining me this week. Be sure to tune in again next week as we explore another account from a witness of the unknown.